Gladiators are one of the most iconic aspects of the ancient Roman world. They fought each other, and they also fought animals. Until this week, no direct evidence of this had been found in Europe, but archaeologists have analysed some bones from the UK that might just change that. Hello and welcome to a 7 Days of Science special feature episode, where we bring you some of the biggest breaking news stories. From discoveries at the edge of the known universe to groundbreaking dinosaur species being named, we're bringing cutting edge science straight to you. Let's get into the video. Gladiators were a massive part of Roman culture, especially in the capital itself. They were first seen during the days of the Roman Republic, before the emperors. The very first gladiatorial combat was performed at a funeral, as part of the funerary celebrations of Junius Brutus Pera in 264 BC. Only three pairs of gladiators fought in this first instance, but gladiator fights quickly became much more extravagant. Just 80 years later, at the funeral of Publicius Licinius, 60 pairs of gladiators were fighting. It quickly became a good way to gain popularity with the masses, and Roman politicians would spend huge sums of money on gladiatorial games. We don't know exactly why it started, and it was unlikely to be a blood sacrifice thing. These gladiators were rarely killed during combat, as they were very expensive to train up. But soon enough, the elite of Rome were sponsoring bigger and longer games to gain popular support in the Republic. Eventually, this became something only the emperors could do in Rome, and it became part of the many ways the emperor could try to keep the people happy. This wasn't just limited to the city of Rome itself, however, as gladiators fought all over the empire for the entertainment of the people. There is a fair amount missing from our library of direct archaeological evidence for this, though, and one particular thing we didn't really have was evidence of a gladiator versus animal combat in Europe. The paper that's come out this week looks like it's changed that. This brings us to the Venationes, which were a variety of animal-based acts that could occur in the arena. This could be more peaceful things like trained routines or exhibitions of particularly exotic animals from around the empire, but it was the fights that generated the most public excitement. For this reason, Roman politicians and later emperors put an increasing effort into games with an increasing number of animals of increasing rarity. Julius Caesar sponsored Venationes that lasted five days, ending with a true Venatio that saw 500 men fight 20 elephants, and then 1,000 men fight 20 elephants with three men mounted on each. Hippopotamuses, bears, crocodiles, bulls, tigers, leopards, and famously lions were used in games, fighting each other, armed men, or in wild animal executions known as damnatio ad bestias. Most of the evidence we get for this is either textual or artistic, so it's not direct evidence for these fights happening. Until this paper, like we mentioned earlier, there was no direct evidence of this happening in Europe, although there are plenty of depictions of gladiators fighting animals on various mosaics and artefacts around the continent. In Britain, there isn't even any direct textual evidence of a Venatio happening. The site that this paper was using remains from is about a kilometer from the city centre of York, a city founded by the Romans in the 1st century AD. Originally, the city was called Eboracum, and it was founded as a fort by the famous 9th Legion. Eventually, the settlement grew and became the provincial capital. The site within York itself is called Driftfield Terrace, and the development of the area instigated what eventually became an archaeological dig that uncovered a host of burials between 2004 and 2005. While some were cremation burials, a majority were burials without cremation. There's a great range in dates for these remains as well, starting in the early 2nd or perhaps even the 1st century AD, and ending in the late 4th century. What this burial site was for is not known for certain, but it's believed that many of the individuals could be gladiators. Evidence for this can be seen on the bones themselves, as many of these people had healed injuries on their heads, faces, fingers, and vertebrae, suggesting that they had seen a lot of combat. Another notable feature of the cemetery is the fact that some 70% of the bodies uncovered here had been decapitated, with the skulls being found positioned at the feet of the skeletons. 
The archaeologists are also quite sure that these decapitations were performed as executions rather than as funerary rituals, since the necks were cut from back to front and the heads were not always entirely removed. So it looks like the objective was just to kill them rather than to remove the head from a dead body before burial in a ritualistic manner, which is a practice seen in some other Roman burials. The people interred here also seem to have been low status individuals, rarely accompanied by grave goods. Additionally, they were almost all adult men between the ages of 18 and 45, except for one woman and seven children. Isotopic and genetic analyses of the bones also indicate that they originated from across the Roman Empire with at least one person from the Middle East and another who had Scandinavian ancestry. All of this seems to show that the people buried here had been taken from across the empire and fought repeatedly throughout their lives before being executed in what was likely a combat arena. So, researchers mostly agree that the best explanation for the Driffield Terrace site is that this was a cemetery for gladiators. Among all the decapitated bodies uncovered at Driffield Terrace, one particular skeleton was exhumed which preserves signs that this individual had died in an especially gruesome way. This body had been buried in the same box as two other gladiators, probably in the middle to late part of the 3rd century. He was a male aged between 26 and 35 years old and stood about 5 foot 7 in height. This man had been decapitated as well, but the injuries that have proven to be the most intriguing are the various bite marks on his hip bones. Both sides of the left crest and spine of the ilium display distinct depressions, and there are some additional indentations on the forward-facing side of the right iliac spine. There are also a couple of regions of crushed bone on the hip. All of these perforations and damage to the bone appear to be consistent with an attack from a large carnivore, and so it looks like this rather unfortunate man was bitten into by a big cat. The researchers were able to rule out dogs, bears or boars as alternative culprits for the bites on the hip, as they don't show any of the characteristic signs left by attacks from these animals, nor do they appear to have been inflicted by a human constructed weapon. By using a light surface scanner, the researchers were able to digitally reconstruct the bite marks and examine them in great detail, revealing that they had many of the key features of a large cat attack. The punctures match the expected depth that a large cat's teeth would penetrate into the bone and the curvature of the bite marks lines up with the placement of the teeth in a cat's mouth. When cats such as lions and tigers kill their prey, they usually target the neck, crushing the windpipe and fracturing vertebrae. Leopards and jaguars, meanwhile, mostly focus on puncturing or crushing the skull. However, Lions and tigers will also drag their prey by the legs or hips, and so this may have been what happened in this case, with the big cat dragging this poor man about as he was dying, or perhaps once he was already dead. So what does this mean for what we know about this kind of history? Well, if it's true, then it's pretty massive news for helping us understand spectacle culture around the empire. Britain, and especially York, is right on the edge of the empire and isolated by water, so getting a lion all the way to York is a remarkable feat indeed, and one that would have taken considerable effort. It likely would have been carried out for a special occasion, but again, we know very little about this. In addition, Venationes came with great danger for the arena workers and spectators, so a specialised arena would have had to have been present for such an event to occur. York despite being a provincial capital, has no known amphitheatre. The discovery of Colchester Circus in 2004 was an encouraging one, as it suggested that there could be large entertainment spaces yet to be discovered, and many believe that the presence of an amphitheatre in York is almost a certainty given the city's importance. Part of the difficulty with doing a full excavation of York is that, well, it's still a city and people still live there. Ultimately, this discovery will likely inspire a massive boost to excavation efforts all around Europe, and especially Britain. It really is a tantalising bit of evidence that suggests a whole aspect of Roman culture that could yet provide a host of more discoveries. Historians will want to know what exactly went down in the arena. Was it a fight or an execution? And if it was an execution, who was being executed? Was it a spectacle punishment for a mutinous soldier 
or something else? And who brought the lion in and why? A lot of work has been done into the procurement of such exotic animals for Venationes in Rome itself. But if this practice was more wide scale across Europe, what implications does that have for this industry? Some historians have already been arguing that the emperor was almost as concerned with being able to supply enough animals for Venationes and other shows as he was with trying to bring in all the bread and olive oil. Well, there you go. A really interesting paper that could play a vital part in how we go about trying to understand how Rome entertained the populace at the fringes of the empire. If you'd like to keep up to date with the latest science news with our weekly science videos, do subscribe to the 7 Days of Science channel. We also have our Patreon for tons of behind the scenes content, early access to scripts, and our increasingly iconic monthly discussion videos, one of which is available to view on the channel right now. For now, have a lovely week, and we'll see you on Wednesday.